Um, I'm going to start uh, with this guy. Uh, this is um, David Trudinick. He is the uh, Member of Parliament for Bosworth in Leicestershire. Uh, he's sometimes nicknamed the MP for Holland and Barrett, such as his love of all alternative medicines. Um, and uh, as you can see from this quote uh, up here, uh, he has some rather uh, interesting views, shall we say, about science. Uh, as you can see here, he gave a speech uh, in the House of Commons a few years ago uh, in which he claimed that surgeons would not operate by full moon because blood doesn't clot properly. This man is not only uh, an elected member of parliament, he claimed £700 on his parliamentary expenses for astrology software. Uh, not only has this man uh, been returned to parliament uh, again and again, uh, but earlier this year he was actually elected by his Tory backbench colleagues to sit on the Science and Technology Select Committee. He's a really remarkable uh, example of everything that is wrong with the way in which science and public policy interact uh, today. And he's, he's a terrible, he's, he's, he's a good example, not actually because there are loads and loads and loads of MPs like him. Uh, there are very few uh, members of parliament, politicians of all stripes, who you can meaningfully call anti-science uh, in the way that, uh, that, that David Trudinick is. But the fact that he was elected by his colleagues to be in the very place where he should be kept furthest away from uh, illustrates something different, which is uh, the big problem, the big disconnect between science and public policy is an indifference. Uh, it's, 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 it's politicians, it's MPs who have never even thought uh, about science at all. They've never considered what it might have to offer uh, to public policy uh, in many ways. And I think uh, that this is rather sad because I think it actually stops them from doing their jobs uh, better. Uh, it's not surprising, uh, in a way, when you look at where MPs come from. Uh, there are, as you probably know, 650 uh, members of parliament in the, in the Commons. Uh, there are 158 of those who have a background in business. Uh, there are 90 uh, what you might call professional politicians. That includes all three of the main party leaders. Uh, there are uh, 86 lawyers. There are 38 from the media. And uh, does anybody know how many scientists there are? Well, the answer is one. There is a single member of parliament, Julian Huppert, uh, the MP for Cambridge, uh, who has a PhD uh, in science and who's actually worked as a research scientist. And this matters, I think, not because Julian Huppert's, Huppert's uh, great knowledge of structural biology is important when he sits on the Home Affairs Select Committee. That's obviously uh, a, a silly proposition. Uh, but it matters because there are far too few politicians out there who, who understand this. And it's what Carl Sagan so brilliantly encapsulated that science is so much more than a body of knowledge. It's actually a way of thinking. It's a uniquely valuable tool for actually evaluating the world, working out what's so, what isn't, what works, what doesn't. Uh, it's, it's rigorous for, for, for really um, three uh, main reasons. Um, First of all, it's about not only having great ideas, uh, but it's about testing those ideas, about subjecting them to evaluation according to the best possible evidence uh, that you can accumulate. Uh, it also recognises that all of us are biased. All of us would like our pet theories to be true, and we'll seek out information that tries to confirm that. And so science has developed a number of mechanisms, controls, uh, randomization, replication by, uh, by, by, by independent people uh, in order to try to overcome that. And, and finally, science is provisional. Uh, it can, everything we find out through science can always be improved upon. Uh, it's never the last word. Better evidence comes along, we can change our minds. In fact, we're good at changing our minds in the scientific world. Uh, politics, perhaps not so much. And I think that's a real problem, because what happens then is instead of getting what politicians like to say they make, which is evidence-based policy, uh, what they really prefer is something rather different. It's policy-based evidence. What they do is they look around for evidence that supports what they want to do anyway. 
And they abuse evidence so often and in so many different ways uh, that you can, you can actually draw up something of a taxonomy. There are so many uh, different forms of evidence abuse. I'll, I'll just talk briefly about three of them. Uh, the first one is what I call evidence shopping. Uh, and a great example of this has been drugs policy uh, over recent years, where uh, the successive Home Secretaries have uh, taken decisions over the classification uh, of drugs in which they have overruled their expert committee uh, of scientists uh, advising them on what the harm is. And what they've done is instead of looking at uh, the whole of the evidence that this expert committee uh, has looked at, they've cherry-picked the one or two studies that seem to show uh, what they want it to show. We saw it uh, with cannabis after the experiment here in Brixton. Uh, we saw it, we've seen it just in the past couple of weeks uh, with CAT. And uh, I think this is really damaging. The second uh, uh, area is fixing the evidence. This, this boils down to uh, the simple rule that if you don't like the expert advice you're getting, you change the advisor you're getting it from. Uh, ministers do this all the time. George W. Bush was an absolute master of it with regards to environmental policy. And of course, with drugs policy recently, we had this again with uh, uh, Professor David Nutt, who was sacked uh, as the government's chief drugs advisor, essentially for telling them things uh, that they didn't want to hear. Uh, finally, and, and this one in many ways is my, is my favourite, there's something that I call uh, clairvoyant evidence. And, and this is uh, brilliantly summed up by an advisor to Patricia Hewitt when she was uh, health secretary, who said that um, home births are safe and we will commission research to show that they are safe. <laughs> it doesn't really need very much more uh, elaboration than that. So, so evidence abuse is one thing that I think leads to poorer public policy uh, than we should have uh, here. But there's, there's something else as well, which is, of course, sometimes we don't have evidence. And sometimes we have to take decisions uh, where evidence isn't out there. Uh, and in that case, I think we need to behave uh, more like this. Ralph Waldo Emerson pointed out that the more experiments we make, the better. And science is rather good at doing experiments. Every public policy that we introduce should be treated as an experiment, as something that we should learn from, something that we should gather data from, uh, evaluate it, and work out whether that policy actually did uh, what it was supposed to. And there's one type of experiment in particular that we could use far more fruitfully than we do at the moment, and that's something called the randomized controlled trial. Now, this is something those of you who have any familiarity with medicine will, be, will know about already. It's, it's the strongest kind of experiment where you set up two groups. You want to, set, you want to test an intervention. That could be a drug. Uh, it could be a, a teaching technique. It could be uh, a sentencing policy for young offenders. What you do is you set up two groups. You have one who get the new intervention you want to test and one who get what they would otherwise have got anyway, the next best drug on the market, the standard sentencing policy, etc. And critically, you randomize people to go into uh, the intervention group uh, or the control group. You select them to go in at random. And, and this random allocation is very, very important because it means that you actually end up testing what you want to test. There's no, there are n you, you can be very confident uh, that there are no pre-existing differences between the two groups that might then explain uh, any results that you get out. And we do this far too seldom in public policy. I'll give you a good example, um, and that's teaching kids to read. Now, uh, the trendy way of doing that now is synthetic phonics. And synthetic phonics has been around uh, and popular for nearly 15 years now in this country, following some really interesting results from Scotland, uh, which suggested uh, that uh, phonics were quite effective at teaching kids to read. Now, that study happened, uh, I think, back in 1999. And there's been argument backwards and forwards ever since about phonics. In that time, there has not been a good randomized controlled trial of phonics versus the whole word uh, method of teaching kids to read. If we had done that back in 1999, followed kids for five years, followed the, the, the interventions to see what actually made the difference with a rigorous method of science, uh, we would know by now. There wouldn't be this hand-waving political debate in which, quite frankly, neither side has good evidence. Uh, I think it's terribly sad uh, that we don't do this more.
And it's not just at national level that we can do this. We can do it at local level too. Now, I live um, just off of Croxted Road uh, in, in Herne Hill, uh, just down the road from here. And uh, as those of you familiar with the area will know, Croxted Road is the boundary between uh, Southwark and Lambeth. And uh, on one side of a road, uh, I think this is uh, Southwark, we have bins like this. Uh, three different bins for uh, ordinary household waste, uh, recycling, and garden waste. Uh, and on the other side of a road, oh, we've lost the slide. Anyway, on the other side of a road in Lambeth, uh, there's just one type of bin. Uh, you just have a general waste bin, and then you have uh, a plastic bag that goes out for your recycling, and a kind of canvas bag for your garden waste. And um, I don't think either council has any idea which method actually encourages people to recycle more. Um, it would be very easy to do an experiment. You could randomize streets uh, in both boroughs uh, to one method uh, or to the other method so that uh, households are allocated at random to one or the other. You know then, uh, if you do it at random, uh, that there isn't some kind of uh, uh, pre-existing uh, characteristic of the people who get the recycling bin or the people who don't that, that, that maybe might explain why they're more uh, or less likely uh, to recycle. Uh, these are things that I think are really uh, plausible to do at every level uh, of, uh, 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 of government, from uh, local councils uh, right up uh, to Westminster uh, and even internationally. Um, Finally, why don't we get this? Why is it uh, that despite uh, the way in which science has such enormous potential to contribute, why don't we get it? Well, I think it boils down uh, to the fact that we don't demand it. Uh, it's actually up to us. Uh, we get very much the politicians uh, that we deserve in democracies uh, such as the UK. And frankly, those of us who care about science and its methods, those of us who appreciate it, uh, have been bad at demanding uh, that our leaders actually appreciate it uh, as well. Um, I spent some time uh, uh, while writing my book, The Geek Manifesto, which is about all of this, with uh, uh, Nicola Blackwood, who's a, a Tory MP, uh, who pointed out to me that when she gets uh, a big email post bag on an issue, uh, it doesn't make her feel that she has to agree with what all her constituents are telling her, but it damn well makes her certain that she has to get informed uh, about that issue. Uh, that's the hurdle that we have to overcome. As I said at the beginning, uh, the problem with science and politics is not that there are lots of politicians like David Trudinick out there who just don't get it at all, who are anti-science. The problem uh, is one of indifference, but indifference is so much more easily overcome uh, than antagonism. It's really up to us. Uh, politics and public policy will start to do science better uh, the moment that those of us who appreciate science uh, start to engage with policy better. Thank you very much.